So I was talking to a really good friend of mine about how I wanted to build something with an epoxy river. And he said, well, I need a TV stand. You want to make one of those with an epoxy river top? I said, absolutely. So we got into SketchUp and mocked up some options, and this is what we landed on. Let's get started. Now, I've been told that I'm the poplar guy because everything I make is out of poplar. That's because it's beautiful and it's really inexpensive, uh, but it cannot compete with walnut. This is dark American walnut and it is gorgeous, but it comes with a pretty hefty price tag. Now, once we get everything fired up, we need to get our boards ripped to the correct width so we can start making batches and get our blanks all queued up. We opted for 17 inches deep for our depth, which is pretty standard for TV stands. So what I'm doing here is just getting our boards batched out. Um, that way I can get things glued up. For our glue up, we are gonna use the domino to really help with alignment and give us nice flat boards, which is going to be key for getting our carcasses put together. Now, I'll throw in the quick disclaimer here. You don't have to have a domino. You could totally use a dowling jig or a biscuit joiner, or if your edges are jointed well enough, you don't really need alignment. Just get good clamping pressure and some calls and you'll get the job done. Then while we were waiting for those panels to glue up and cure, we could take a trip to one of my favorite places, Sassafras Slabs. This is a local slab guy just outside of Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's run by a guy named Ron. He has a great selection. And with a little bit of searching, we found the perfect slab. Oh, and Emmy helped too. Did you find a good slab? Did you find a good one? <laughs> Wait, people are filming? I don't wanna do anything. <laughs> With our slab in hand, we could head back to the shop and get those panels out of the clamps and start getting them squared up to make our carcass. Now that those are out of the clamps, we can go ahead and mark our line to get things squared up using the track saw. And hey, if you've been enjoying the content so far, remember to click that subscribe button and ring that notification bell. It really helps the channel. That's good. Once we got the slab ripped down, I could kind of flip the pieces inward and get an idea of what this river was gonna look like. And that's when I started getting really excited. And now that the slab was ripped down and ready to go, we could start working on our form for the epoxy pour. Now I'm using melamine here, and I was planning to use tuck tape as well as mold release to seal the edges. And I kind of just went crazy with the tuck tape and skipped the mold release entirely. I've seen a few horror stories on YouTube where people have tried the mold release and the melamine still sticks, and then you gotta peel off and scrape and chisel and I just figured I'd skip that whole step. This is a pretty small form, so we, we're not gonna use that much tape. It's gonna be okay. Now, you can't really see it in this shot, but I did run a bead of silicone across the edge before attaching each wall, and then followed up with a bead of silicone on the interior corners. We wanted to do everything we could to make sure that leaking was not an issue. While this isn't a huge pour of epoxy, 
it's the biggest pour I've ever done and I really don't want it ending up on my floor. Some of the best advice I can give here uh, with my limited epoxy pouring experience is give your silicone a full 12 hours to cure. I know some bottles say they're you know waterproof and ready to go within four hours or two hours. Don't risk it. Epoxy is really expensive. Give yourself the 12 hours, wait until tomorrow, and then make your pour. Speaking of the pour, before we can do that, I needed to go through and chisel out all of the kind of plunky or dried out dead wood from the slab. Uh, doesn't mean the slab's bad. This is a very common theme with any kind of hardwood slab. Like you're going to have spots that just need chiseled out and clean. And we're going to backfill these with epoxy. So it's going to give a really cool look. All right, so the form is made, the slabs are in, they're not secure yet, like I'm still gonna run a bead of silicone underneath each live edge river to keep the epoxy from running underneath and wasting. Uh, and I'm gonna run a bead around the voids that we need to fill on the top. But first, we need to figure out how much epoxy we're gonna need for this space. Uh, so what I did is take measurements about every eight to 10 inches or so across from slab to slab. And I forget what the number ended up being, but the average distance ended up being five inches. So then we'll take our total length of the form, which is 66 and a half inches, because our total length of the actual top will be 65 and a half. We gave ourselves a little bit of extra playroom there to trim everything up, make it nice. So we'll take our length of 66 and a half inches and our average distance of five inches and plug that into a calculator, a, a volume calculator. And I'll throw a link down to this down below, so don't worry. But that gives us a total amount of 332 and a half cubic inches, which is useless for what we need. So we'll take that to Google and plug that into a cubic inches to liter converter, and that'll give us 5.44 liters. We'll go ahead and round up to six because we want to make sure we have plenty. And our resin is actually in gallons. So to make this simple, we convert it to liters to gallons. Six liters is 1.58 gallons. So we'll use one full gallon of resin and half a gallon of hardener and that should be what we need to get this done. Now, I'm not gonna pour this until tomorrow because we still gotta run the silicone and I wanna give that plenty of time to cure up, but it's getting exciting. Let's watch this. So some of the biggest issues I read about epoxy situations going horribly wrong are not stirring it long enough and not getting the ratios right. So I made sure to really pay attention to my ratios and I really spent a lot of time mixing. My instructions said at least five minutes, I think I spent nine to 10, just running the paddle, scraping the sides, scraping the bottom, making sure I mixed all of the material that was in there and then added the pigment. Now you'll notice when we go to pour, it has this kind of pale white color. Uh, this is supposed to be a blue epoxy. So I was kind of nervous here, not really sure what was going on, just hoping the epoxy was going to darken as the process went on. And then I found out that because I had stirred it so long, I mixed up a lot of bubbles and that's what's causing that lighter color is just the amount of bubbles in the epoxy itself. So the resin is poured. Uh, scariest part of this uh, is hopefully over. Now these are some air bubbles that based on what the epoxy says, these will pop themselves, but I'll follow up with a heat torch and clean them up as we go. It's looking pretty good. It wasn't quite as blue as I thought it would be. It's almost more like a sky blue. So I'm hoping it darkens uh, as it cures, but I guess we'll see. Funny enough, I forgot to put down any kind of uh, drip cloth, uh, but thankfully our mold is rock solid and there's no drips, but to be safe, I'll probably throw this down anyway. Oh yeah, there's that blue color we were looking for. Man, was I glad that I got that color right. Um, what I didn't know about a deep pour epoxy is that they take a lot longer to cure. Normally I work with a 24 hour curing epoxy. The deep pour stuff takes 76 hours minimum. So while that was curing upstairs, we got back to the panels and got working on putting the carcass of the TV stand together.
Now I'm marking out for dominoes here to connect my side panels, but if you don't have a domino, you could use dowels here. You could just honestly use screws straight through the bottom and countersink them in. They'll be on the bottom, no one would ever see them, but I like dominoes, they help with alignment, it makes the process faster. I did, however, make the mistake of trying to do this tape trick where you would catch the squeeze out of the glue on the tape and make cleanup easier, but it totally backfired. Um, I got squeezed out on the tape. The tape was hard to get out. The tape got caught in the joint, so it could be operator error, but I'm not a fan of the tape, the squeeze out area method. time for an update we got the middle carcass section of the tv stand glued up uh, i decided to go with dominoes just because it's a lot faster and easier than trying to do i was going to do dados at first and that just seemed unnecessarily difficult uh, when you have the domino i've paid for the tool i like to use the tool if you don't have it you could use pocket holes here uh, you could take screws directly in from the side since they'll be inside of a cupboard you wouldn't really see them and you could just plug those uh, so there's a bunch of options. Use what you have. I'm using what I have. So that's the inner compartment. And this humongous guy is the outer compartment. And I have pretty much every clamp I could think of to make sure I got this totally squared up. Uh, but it's a total of 65 and a half inches long. And then that piece will fit right inside of there. And then we'll be ready to put the top on. And here I'm just getting things set up. Oh, well, hello legs. Who invited those? Oh man, that's embarrassing. Uh, <laughs> getting things set up here. And just to show you guys that Domino is not the only way to attach things, I decided to use screws through the underside to lock this center compartment in place. Wanted to make sure that the cabinet could fit several different things depending on what the need is so we added some shelf pin holes just so we can have an adjustable shelf in each cabinet side now that the carcass is at a good stopping point we're going to go ahead and pull some stock for our base the base is going to consist of two different components feet and apron the feet are all four inches tall and are going to have a double taper on them Anytime I'm doing a double taper, I know from previous experiences when I built the dresser that it's easy to botch this if you don't rotate your piece correctly. So I usually make a good handful of extras. Now, nothing too scientific going on here. I'm just getting my feet in place and then measuring and cutting my apron pieces. I typically cut them along and then just take bit by bit off until I have a nice perfect fit and then we're going to use dominoes to connect these aprons and feet. So I'm running into an issue here. I need to glue up the apron uh, for the base but I don't have clamps long enough and I can combine clamps and kind of gang them up but I don't really like doing that because you don't get really good squeezing pressure so what I'm going to do it's a trick I picked up from Jason over at Bourbon Moth Woodworking if you haven't seen his channel definitely go check it out but basically what he likes to do is use CA glue and activator on a veneered plywood and you attach it directly to the board it serves as a call and then when you put your domino in you can clamp off of this board instead of trying to go the whole length and that should give us plenty of clamping pressure let's see and I was pleased to find out that this gave plenty of pressure to pull on. And then later we could just knock these off with a hammer and sand off the glue. Thanks, Jason. Good call. Since the cabinet's being made out of solid walnut, it's gonna be heavy. And I wanted to make sure I had plenty of support. So we added another foot there at the bottom before we decided to call it a night. And the next day we could finally demold our slab. Can't wait to see this thing. And after three days of waiting, I was thrilled to find out that everything had cured up really well and getting it out of the mold was super easy. Apparently an inconvenience. Now, what would be a huge inconvenience is sanding this by hand. 
So I was stoked when I found this local cabinet shop here in town that would run this through their huge $50,000 time saver machine. Saved me a lot of time and gave me a nice, perfectly flat top to work with. To attach the top to the carcass, you guys have seen this before, I'm just using coarse pocket hole screws with a washer and an oversized hole to attach and allow for wood movement. Then once the top was attached, I could get an accurate measurement for how thick my face framing needed to be. And I just took this one piece at a time, taping the bottom, clamping the other parts to get everything nice and secure. Once that was all dried up, I could go back and do sanding and profiling. I did a lot of hand sanding here. I would hate for Maddie, Maiko, or Eli, my friend who I'm making this for, his children, to get any kind of splinters or have any issues with this. So I made sure to do a lot of due diligence for sanding. I also wanted there to be a visual separation between the base and the carcass itself. So I took my router and added an eighth inch uh, groove across the top. And this is a small detail, but I really think it adds a lot. And for the record, this is definitely a trim router job, but for the life of me, I could not find the bit I needed with the quarter inch shank. So I just used my larger router. It got the job done, but make sure you're being safe and trying to find the right tool for the job. Once that was done, I could go ahead and look at attaching the base. And this thing was starting to come together really well. I know it's been a bit of a long road, but hang in there with me, we're almost there. The last thing we need to do here is create our cabinet doors, and I used this uh, Craig jig for this, it's quick and easy. And then once we had those attached, we could go ahead and start laying out our hardware. For our handles, we opted for these clean, modern black handles. They're the same pulls I used on my TV stand, and we love them. You'll have to forgive the sweat droplets here. It was insanely hot, and we were just trying to get this one wrapped up. Before we throw on that finish, we had to go ahead and mark it with the Donnygram Builds brand. The finish we're going to use for this project is called Rubio Monocoat. It only requires one coat, hence the name, Monocoat. Uh, but it does a great, great job with darker woods like walnut. It just really makes it pop and makes that grain come to life. Could not be happier with how this project is coming together. Apart from this finish only taking one coat, arguably the best thing about it is how easily the application is. All you have to do is put on a good amount using a squeegee, let it soak in for a few minutes, and then wipe up the excess, and you're good to go. Then, once the finish is cured up, we are ready for that beautiful B-roll. That's gonna do it for this week's video. Thank you so much for following along. I cannot tell you how thrilled I am with this piece. The Live Edge Wizard Top is beautiful. The epoxy cured so well, and you can't beat Dark American Walnut. This is easily the nicest piece I have ever made, and I am absolutely thrilled with it. If you enjoyed the video, go ahead and subscribe to the channel, like the video, and leave a comment, and maybe even share it with a friend. That really helps to promote growth for the channel and show people that I make really cool things and really cool videos. If you have any feedback on the epoxy, on the live edge slabs, it's the first time I've ever worked with stuff like this, so I'm welcome to any kind of feedback and tips and tricks that maybe you have that I didn't know. That way I can do better next time. So we're all about improvement here at Don and Graham Builds. Until next time, get out there and start your own project.